Hello everyone, welcome or welcome back to Architects Not Architecture. This is the 11th event of our virtual world tour and we are delighted to virtually travel with you to the UK. Today we have the great honor to welcome Simon Alford and Katrina Stewart to our stage. We hope you are as curious as we are to hear what they will share with us. My name is Fermin Tribaldos. I'm live from Hamburg, Germany, and I will be your host for the next one and a half hours. We have had over 15,000 participants from 108 countries at the past 10 events. Before the pandemic, we were doing in-person events in various European cities, including London. And although we really miss meeting our community in an actual auditorium, we are thrilled to now be able to reach people from all over the world. So thank you for joining us. First thing first, what is Architects Not Architecture? For those of you who are joining us for the first time, let me briefly introduce our format. At Architects Not Architecture, we do not focus on architectural projects, but on the individuals who designed and built them. We often know the projects and awards of renowned architects, but what we often miss out on are the people behind them. It is them and their unique personal history, which influence how they work and what they create. So we try to bring to the stage what too often remains unseen. Today, our speakers will talk about their career paths, their influences, and the experiences that shaped them and made them become who they are today. And the main rule is, they are not allowed to talk about their own projects. With this virtual world tour, we are taking you on tour around the globe to meet some of the most influential architects of our time and get to know them on a personal level. Make sure you follow our social media or sign up for our newsletter on our website so you don't miss any upcoming events. Actually, we can confirm that we will be back with another virtual world tour after the summer break. Before that, our next stops will be Mexico and Denmark, but today, today it's time for United Kingdom. This event is kindly supported by Jung and Cosentino. Both of them are very active in the UK. We thank them for their trust in us and our work. We have video messages from them, and let me start by passing the mic to Olivia from Cosentino. Functionality and beauty, two pillars that together form fantastic architecture and design. Our commercial design centre here in London is based in the heart of Clerkenwell and plays host to architects and designers from across the UK. Designed to be a destination to discover Costantino's product range and to help demonstrate how our surfaces can be utilised for a wide range of applications. Cosentino is a Spanish, family-owned company located in Almeria that produces and distributes high-value, innovative surfaces. Our most iconic surfaces include Decton, ultra-compact surface, and Silestone, composite quartz. Decton can be used for a number of applications, including facades, kitchen countertops, and bathroom cladding. Decton is a carbon-neutral product for its entire life cycle. This has been achieved through the extraction of the raw materials, the emissions from its production cycle, and those derived from its use. Silestone is low maintenance and offers a high resistance to stains and scratches. 2021 will see Silestone transform into a mineral hybrid surface using a new pioneering technology called Hybric, which uses 98% recycled water and renewable energy in its manufacturing process. The result is a more beautiful and sustainable product that maintains the guaranteed quality of Silestone. We inspire our clients with our innovative and sustainable surfaces, both online 
and offline. Our platform, Cosentino We, connects our community of professionals, providing them access to exclusive services. We would love to welcome you into our showroom to talk more about how we can work together, because beyond functionality and beauty, we look for inspiration through innovative spaces. We would also like to mention the support of our media partners, New London Architecture, Design Boom, Arc Daily, Icon, and DCIN. Today we are welcoming our speakers, Simon Alford and Katrina Stewart, who will join us live from London. Each of them will have 30 minutes on our virtual stage, 20 minutes to give a presentation, followed by a 10 minute interview. After the two talks, we will have a round of discussion where we will ask some of your questions, so make sure you get ready and use the designated box on our website to send in your questions. You will find it on the right side when you scroll down. And that's the plan for today. So before we start, let me pass the mic to our partner, Diana from Jung. What do people talk about when Jung and architecture are mentioned in the same sentence? It's about color, shape and style, about materiality, directions, taste and encounter. Since 2006, Jung has been providing a platform for an in-depth discussion of architectural themes and related social issues. Nationally and internationally, a contemporary form of professional exchange has established itself beyond the usual communication structures. The Jung Architecture Talks are not an expert-only format. This regular event program is synonymous with lively discussions about vibrant topics in architecture and with networking taking place in a pleasant atmosphere. So my experience with uh, Young Architecture Talks has gone over almost a 10 year period and I've seen it grow from something that is just very local uh, here in Germany to something that actually draws in a lot of interest also from outside. Uh, it's now an international architecture talk. For three years now, Jung has been supporting all international Architects Not Architecture events in addition to the Young Architecture Talks. Since we all can't travel as we used to, we are joining the virtual Arna Tour around the globe as well, where we all can visit selected cities and virtually meet some of their most relevant architects. After all, architecture generally lives from the power of images. So please enjoy. Our first speaker was born in London. He studied architecture at the University of Sheffield and at the Bartlett University. Together with Jonathan Hall, Paul Monham and Peter Morris, he founded the architecture practice AHMM in 1989. Today, the studio has 200 architects working on projects worldwide. Their work has been widely recognized with the highest national and international awards. He is a trustee of the London School of Architecture, has been chairman of the Architecture Foundation, a trustee of the Architecture Association Foundation, and he has previously been vice president for education at the RIVA, as well as chair of design review at the Chartered Association of Building Engineers. He is also a writer, critic, advisor, and a frequent judge and visiting professor at the Bartlett and Harvard Graduate School of Design. And in addition to that, he has been elected president of the RIVA and will assume the presidency from the 1st of September this year. We are deeply honored to have him joining us today. Welcome, Simon Orford. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today and this great initiative, Architects Not Architecture, 
architects realizing that architecture isn't the beginning and end of life is in my view a very healthy thing for architecture. You can care about architecture, but life matters even more. I'm Simon Alford and I'm a London boy, London night and day, born and bred. However, like most Londoners, my parents come from somewhere else. My father on the left in 1930 um, is kind of just about to be moved out of the slums his family lived in, in the northern steel city of Sheffield, where his father was a skilled fitter. My mother on the left lived in an altogether posher world where she could afford to have ballerina outfits, but she also came from a steel area, Middlesbrough and Redcar. So they were both people of the North, which is a significant part of my perspective on life. Uh, my parents met at Sheffield University. It was a very, very different time 70 years ago. Both my grandparents were dead before I was born. And my grandfather, who looks about 70 there, is only 48. So that was the, you know, that was the life then for, for the working man. It was tough. Um, my parents were part of the post-war Brave New World in the 50s. And um, when my father was studying architecture, they cycled on a tandem, broke into the uh, Unite and uh, toured the site and camped there for two days. So yeah, there was a sort of era completely different from Instagram, Instagram of discovery by yourself of a new world. And my father came to London and he discovered a new world of um, international architectural practice. He didn't enjoy it in Sheffield. It was a Beaux-Arts school, but he joined the firm of York, an Englishman, uh, Rosenberg, a Czech, and Mardell, uh, half Finn, half Swede. So it was an international practice founded just after the war. It was an extraordinary story because he had been introduced to architecture by FRS York's book, The Modern House. And when he was 27, he's the man with the champagne glass and the serious look on his face, York made him a partner and gave him the gift of designing Gatwick Airport. I was born in South London. I'm a North Londoner, but after three weeks, we managed to escape. There's my mother outside our modernist span housing, which my parents couldn't stand because it was too communal. And there's me being bathed in what I think is a toilet, but I'll pretend is a bidet. I was close to my father. I was the third child, um, father and son. We were focused initially on, on life and football. But I had three sisters and incidentally, I now have three daughters. So I'm used to be dominated um, and being the, the loner within the family. There we are um, on a tour of Europe. So there's my obsession with football. There's a friend of mine who now lives in Berlin that I've known since I was four. And this is my, you know, my birthday cake in, in the pre-corporate world of football. And this is the team I follow, Sheffield Wednesday. I was inculcated into me from birth. So growing up in London, I was always told, you're a northerner, you're from Yorkshire. You have northern blood running through your veins. So heritage was important. There I am playing football. That was my dream till the age of about 17 when I realized I couldn't quite make it. One of my friends went on to play for England, but I wasn't good enough and I drank too much by then. But this is the modern architecture that is a backdrop to my life. This is the house we lived in in the country, just around the corner from the Smithsons, who were regular visitors and installed the fireplace within this house. And I had this strange metropolitan existence and then this absurd kind of rural existence. This is Wiltshire in the 60s. And of course, architecture in terms of the primitive hut is all around me. And we disregarded architecture. We didn't really see it. Like my own children say, dad, we're bored of your buildings. Um, but here we are at Stonehenge before it became a, a monument protected um, from, from physical engagement. And there are my three sisters, two older, one younger. We spent our life on building sites looking at trenches, or here to the extension to that house my father designed, looking at that modular component of modern methods of construction 50 years ago. When I was 11, we went abroad for the first time that I could remember, we'd been there when I was a child, and we spent a month traveling around Europe. Um, and seeing an amazing series of cities and projects. And that was a kind of seminal moment for me. I, I loved drawing, I loved history, um, but I became ever more interested in cities and places. And there you see me um, in front of Le Corbusier's uh, building in saint -Dee. I'm actually looking at architecture though I'm probably not aware of it. And my father who's um, obviously pilgrimage there to find this, what's now a, you know, a UNESCO monument, he's looking at the camera. So architecture was always there. 
I went to an inner city comprehensive. Um, my parents being socialists, having had a good education at grammar schools, um, left me, my father always criticized me for not speaking Latin. And my point was I was living his socialist dream and getting a shoddy education. Um, but I managed to escape. I took a year out and I found myself in an old hill town in the south of France called Vieux Rock Brune. Whereas my father said, well, go up the hill, look at Busier is buried there. I was hoping to get work on the boats, but I couldn't. But I was very good at space invaders. And so in the small village pub called La Grotte, I became a kind of hero, the Englishman who couldn't speak French, but got the highest score on space invaders. In fact, I became a local celebrity such, to such an extent, I got a job as a waiter where I learned French quickly. I then came back to England and did a family trip from New York to San Francisco. We drove across America, which was an amazing experience. America was really to us in the 70s, the land of plenty. My sister still reminds me, we we're excited to find jeans or t-shirts or Converse, all things we get now, but then it was the American dream. And in our small world, somewhere 400 miles outside uh, Los Angeles, we met a man who we joked about meeting, who was a Sheffield Wednesday fan, who we stumbled across in a calico ghost town, which is all about life and small coincidences that we managed to meet and speak to someone we joked about meeting. I then went to Sheffield, back to my roots, they asked me at the interview, why? Why Sheffield? I said, because I want to play football for the university and watch the football team. And I thought the architecture was, was okay. Um, I was later told that was the most honest reply they'd ever had. It was just about okay. It was tough. It was a bit of an autodidactic course. We kind of learned on our own in the studio. And that's where, where I met my partner, Paul Monaghan. And I woke up one day in a lecture that was kind of going from Mesopotamia to modernism to realize that all the people I knew, Ron Heron, Rainer Bannum, Frank Newby, Jim Sterling, um, George Heinrichs, uh, Werner Duttmann, City Architect for Berlin, all these people and the Smithsons who were part of my life, who we regarded as oddballs, pleasant oddballs, were actually eminent figures in architecture. So it was a sudden discovery that the world I was familiar with, but not interested in, but had grown to become intrigued in, I was actually connected into. And I spent the next 20 years of my life not using those connections. I did not want to be my father's son. So I graduated, you know, uh, 50 years on and left Sheffield. It was a case of London calling. London's always calling for me, the place I want to return to. I think of, you know, practice as a global, business, I think of travel, I think of architecture, I, I love working in other cities, but London is my home. I was 21, I got my first job. On the left is, is my sister, my older sister, who tragically died a few years later from a brain hemorrhage. And then on the right is, is a long-term girlfriend of mine. So, you know, and then the back is Paolozzi, the background to our life. Um, I show this picture because my father won some medal, which I won't um, talk about, but the man on the right was called George 32. He was a driver who had spent half his life in prison and the other half of his life uh, driving people around. I liked the edginess of that kind of life. George was a very honest and straight man and was always offering us stolen goods, which we had to decline. But I liked the idea of life being this mix of different things. And then in my year out, I worked for Nick Grimshaw, I'm still friendly with Nick and their office. They're now an office of five or 600 people around the world. At that time, we were six people and I was given incredible responsibility and reward. It was thought that I would go to the AA after Sheffield. Um, Cedric was there, Helen McEachern was there, my father on the right was there, but I didn't want to go there because I felt it was too much of a club. And I wanted again, as I said, break free of that club. So I went to the Bartlett, where I studied under David Dunster, who made the famous comment to me about a scheme. First time I'd ever been critted. There were no crits at Sheffield. You just got a mark. But David said to me, as he looked at my drawings, he goes, this scheme is terribly boring. And he could see my face drop. And he said, but boring is good. And he could see my face rise. And then he said, but of course, it's not quite boring enough. He was an enigmatic man and a brilliant critic. So the four of us worked together on our diploma there, which we call the fifth man. It was about um, collaboration without compromise, doing your own work, but sharing ideas and sharing a common context. We sort of formed a firm when we left, although it was a virtual firm of competitions and work in the evenings and earning a bit of extra money. And Paul and I became the front men for that, 
teaching at various schools, including the Bartlett, where we ran uh, unit five in the degree and unit 10 in the diploma. And in many ways, our mentor there was Peter Cook. We were very different to Peter. We weren't his cup of tea, but we kind of got on. He sort of talked about us as the building unit. And I always said, we're an ideas unit, Peter. We just have an interest in building. And then we formed a practice in 1989. We were 26, 27. We were trying to look mo moody. And we very quickly almost went bust. And we stopped winning competitions, but we learned how to survive. Gambling was one means of survival. Debt was another. And the first commission we got was a house for my parents, a pool house in the garden of their house. There's my father, there's me on site. And someone said to him, I didn't know you like swimming. He said, no, I don't. I like architecture. And clients to me have always been important, not perhaps as important as Philip Johnson said, but this is Simon Silver, someone I've worked with for 30 years. To me, every client, every context, every site is a unique engagement. And that's what makes it kind of endlessly fascinating. And, you know, the people around architecture become incredibly important. Your friends and mentors, Paul Finch, writer, Roger Zagolovich, friend, fellow teacher and client, and Glenn Howells, Mr. Birmingham. And of course, football was always in my life. In the background, without any colour on his face, is Frank Newby, the engineer who, along with Cedric Price, we went to a cup final in 1999. 1991, we won the match. Cedric turned up for the party as his long-term partner, Eleanor Bronze said he, he didn't watch football, but he preferred it to plays because the outcome was always uncertain. These were heavy drinking years, years of survival, smoking and drinking. Then in 2005, I had a heart operation which redefined my life somewhat. It was the year of the ashes. I went for a well-man test, encouraged by Simon Silver, and I got that famous phone call from a doctor. I don't wish to alarm you, but you could drop dead at any moment. Um, it didn't prove to be a uh, terminal, but it did certainly put me back for a few days. And I remember the first day of the 2005 ashes at Lords very well, because I was um, having a heart operation whilst um, not sedated uh, pinging morphine, with the surgeon offering to stop if it became painful, but me knowing it had cost £15,000, encouraging him to carry on regardless of the pain. So life, sport, chance and risk combined. So I still drink, but after those years, I gave up um, smoking, except when I was with Will Alsop, who I always regard as one of the most generous and visionary characters, generous as a human being, hugely creative, um, lived a wonderful life to the full. And you couldn't say to Will, I'm off the cigs. So you get a bottle of wine and 20 Benson Hedges at every meeting you went to. I got married um, to Fiona on the left there. This is the end of our party. We're all fairly blitzed. It's four in the morning. And we went on a strange Route 66 honeymoon where we retraced the journey I'd done when I was 18. And in that strange world of extraordinary coincidences, we opened an office subsequently in Oklahoma because one of my colleagues was there and we thought it was a good fun thing to do where we now have 20 people. And the man on the right is one of our clients for a new art gallery. And the woman on the left is one of our clients in London for a new theater. Nika Burns and Max Weisenhofer, they are a partnership. I didn't know either at the time, but there's this strange world of meeting Nika in London and her saying, I've got a partner in Oklahoma called Max. Do you know him? And that always strikes me, that extraordinary thing, going back to meeting that man in, Chef in the ghost town in Los Angeles. Endless coincidence. 18 months after we were married, we had twins. My wife is Irish. She wanted the names Regan and Erin. I said they were too Irish. And be a clever lady, she said to me, they can both have the middle name Wednesday. So that's Regan Wednesday and Erin Wednesday, as they were christened. And we were rele relegated that season. It seems to be a repeat story in my life. Collaboration is incredibly important to me and collaborating with friends, and I include clients in that, you can't make good architecture without good people who you enjoy collaborating with. And one of my great collaborators is Hanif Kara, the engineer, and we've talked together around the world, most particularly at Harvard. And here we are together in the white collar factory, teaching Harvard students for a couple of years back. And as I traced through these slides, I found history repeating itself. This is Villa Emo that I went to in 1978. This is Villa Emo on the right, 40 years on, 
with me with a group called FABS, the Foreign Architectural Book Society. Chris Wilkinson, Michael Hopkins, Will Allsop, Roger Zagolovich, Paul Finch. But we're at the same building. I knew what it was when I went uh, three years ago. I didn't know what it was when I went 18 years ago, but I love the fact it's, it's delightful architecture, but also utilitarian. My third child, Orla, was born. By then we had a package, Irish name, middle name Wednesday. Engagement in architectural culture has always been important to me. And Ellis Woodman is the gentleman on the right, and I'm retiring here from the Architecture Foundation. Ellis and I and the group worked very hard to save it. And I thought it was a wonderful demonstration of his intellect and generosity in kind of re-engaging London in architectural culture in a place in a void that I felt had been left by the RIBA. So in a bit of spring madness, um, I, lockdown fever, in fact, I decided to stand for president of the RIBA. And um, in a way, I don't know why I did it, but I criticized it. Lots of people said, well, you've got to, you know, you could help change it. There's a lot of good to be done there. And I talked about building a house of architecture and an institute of ideas. And again, in this idea of endless serendipity and connections, uh, Louis Hellman, who worked with my father on Warwick uh, University, drew this idea of my fun palace rather than Cedric Price's fun palace and the queue of people turning up to engage in debate. And that's what interests me in architecture, tolerance, debate, discourse, and acceptance of a diversity of view and ideas, generosity and listening to other voices. In that sense, Le Corbusier said when he went to Pesach and everyone said how it had been damaged, he always said, life is always right. And I've always remembered that idea that architecture is the backdrop to the theater of everyday life. So I have a family, they are hugely important to me, but they are part of that theater of everyday life. So here they are at our 25th uh, birthday party as an office. I no longer attempt to divide clients from consultants, from family, from architecture, from life. It is all one big melting pot. And of course, I like to think history repeats itself. So I repeat uh, my father's journey into architecture. I like to think I've learned his lessons. I don't know if any of my daughters will, will do that, but this daughter plays for Arsenal reluctantly because she lives in London, but is a massive Sheffield Wednesday fan. And so I like this idea of connections back to your roots, third generation histories. And I've always felt that I can only make architecture for people I like but it's not always easy. So that particular daughter, when I was having a particularly bad time with an international client who was paying us a lot of money, but being uh, at the very best disrespectful, she tried to cheer me up with a quote my wife had asked her to write inspired by the film uh, Train Spotters: Choose a life, choose a big family, choose a big fucking television, choose Sheffield Wednesday till you die. I love you, daddy. So to me, Architecture is always the backdrop to the theatre of everyday life. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. And one it minute was, 30 uh, ahead. That, that was great timing. Um, it was wonderful uh, to hear that this insightful presentation, actually I'm uh, kind of shocked so, so much information, so many things uh, to talk about. Uh, this really proves um, how nice it is to talk about all the things done about the projects. Uh, there are so many possible topics to, to discuss with you. Um, I wonder, like right now, we're having so many engagements um, as right now, a president-elect for Riva, um, uh, with your practice, how do you manage your time to still have time for other engagements? Time is something you can stretch when you want to stretch it. You know, I, I, my mother always says, we, your father was easing back and you're doing ever more. And I always pointed out when I was 27, I was designing loft extensions. When he was 27, he was designing an airport. Opportunities mm. come late to architecture. And if you keep mm. yourself alive to the enjoyment of engaging in it, um, you know, it, it keeps you going. But I would say 
for all of us, it's bloody difficult. Let's make no mistake about it. It's wonderful, but if you care about architecture, it's difficult. And what I'm really interested in is how you can kind of balance that with life. Because if you balance it with life, I think you become a better architecture. You, you make a better architecture, you become a better mm. architect. Yes, it makes sense. Um, with so much responsibility, um, do you allow your allow yourself uh, to try new things and maybe eventually to fail? I think the uh, importance of failure is quite significant, as long as the failure is not catastrophic. And I, I always feel I only keep going because I think that our next building should learn from and be better than the last. History will judge mm. that. But to me, innovation through iteration and, and, and confidence and making brave decisions and building relationships is, 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 is the way a practice can, can move forward. So across five projects, you can make a huge difference. If you do it across one project, you know, the, the chances of failure are greater, but you can make iterative progress. And yes, to me, if, if we're not progressing, if, if the future isn't more exciting than the past, then we fail. From um, what, from what, so sorry, what of all that you have achieved, um, makes you most proud it has been a long long journey and uh i don't so i don't tend to look back i i i i, I think there's a rose tinted spectacles i tend to look forward i suppose the idea that we've gone from being four people to having a large office that's become an employee ownership trust we don't own it it has a certain continuity potential the extraordinary talent that goes through that office, some of which leaves, which we also welcome. So I think we've built a, a collegiate practice where people can live their life and in push their architecture. And, mm. and, and to me, it's that engagement with, with a talented uh, cohort and, and still being relevant to it. Mm. Um, now that you are running, I have two questions regarding that. Uh, now that you are running, uh, the fourth largest practice in the UK. How do you measure success? Uh, I only measure it in terms of architecture. So to me, it, it's not how big it is, or the projects, it's not how big they are. The smallest project we, I'm doing is a million pounds, the biggest is a billion pounds. To me, it's all, it's all the same measure. It's the same idea mm -hmm. about architecture. It's the same idea of uncertainty. Your point about taking risks. To me, it's always an adventure. And having a rubbish first five years was great because I never underestimate an opportunity. All, mm. you know, looking at someone's house, looking at someone's, you know, advising people on the possibilities of architecture is still something that I do for fun. It's not always fun, but that's, mm. that, that's the main idea. So to me, yeah. it's an ongoing journey, always. Never and Regarding back. fun, so your stories from those days, from your beginnings, so much you say uh, hard drinking <laughs> um where you, did you have more fun back those days or are you having enjoying the practice of being an architect even more today it, it's better now because in those days we worried every day about going bust yeah that's the money strain was immense the architecture strain mm -hmm. was significant um We never want to be comfortable. We never want to be cozy. You know, we want to be collaborative without compromise. So we run our own projects, Paul and I, but we are mm. incredibly close friends and colleagues and share ideas and influences. But to me, you know, now and the future has got to be better. And if it isn't, we've got to make it better. So I, I have mm. rose tinted glasses. I don't look back at the past as it was fun. I'm glad we lived it that way. You know, but you know, it wasn't always fun. You know, my sister died when she was 35 with a mm. brain tumor. And that makes you realize how lucky you are. Even when that client was driving me mad and my daughter wrote me that note, to me, I always think, what would she give for my problems? Just to be alive, to enjoy life. So, and then mm. my 2005 heart op gave me the same focus. Don't worry about your problems, you know, because you know, they can be blown away by something that you, you couldn't mm. even think about. Did, did you start 
enjoy enjoy even more the the, the sm small things the, the, did you experience kind of um, change of mindset i i like complex problems so to me big projects urban projects unlocking whole bit, pieces of city with with mm -hmm. an architectural act is even more satisfying than designing you know a beautiful object house I like, I prefer the, I'd rather be designing a huge hospital with all its problems, which I'm not designing because I can't get on the lists, but I'd rather be designing a huge hospital than an art gallery. I'm more interested in trying to make the everyday buildings super delightful than to, to, to do the fun bits. You know, we've done art galleries, I'm doing one. They're lovely projects, but to me, it's, 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 mm -hmm. it's the nitty gritty, grainy, dirty stuff that's interesting, where architecture mm -hmm. actually has a positive effect. And the kind of razzle-dazzle projects, which I'm happy to have one or two going, but yeah, I'm loving doing a theatre with Nika Burns and it'll be amazing. But I'm just as, you know, just as much enjoying doing, you know, a thousand affordable homes and in in, in unlocking a, a, a chunk of London. Mm. So you enjoy being that uh, car driver Having the the background and without without the, uh, without the corruption and the prison sentence, uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I did that bit of miss. Um, what took you the lo the longest to understand about architecture? I suppose to build the confidence to realise that architecture, to me, is to make the very very complex very very simple. That's what I'm always looking to do. So I remember being asked to read Tafuri, and I, I have to say I struggled, and I, you know, I, I struggled with the text and the density of it. Um, mm. Dalibor Vesti was a good friend of mine. He, he, I found his writing dense, but I found his company delightful. So I've always kind of taken the ideas. And it was Cedric Price who said to me, "Don't read something you don't enjoy, because the the world is telling you to read it." Yes, test mm. yourself. But actually, architecture is about making complex things legible to everyone, mm -hmm. not wallowing in our own complexity. Mm. And um, as you started with your friends from college, um, college have you, how is this collaboration uh, going nowadays? Has been like three decades of collaboration. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's going reasonably well. We're still very good friends. And the reason is that when we worked together as students in a project called The Fifth Man, because we were four, um, it was our diploma project, we each designed a building and then we collaborated on how they came together in a place, a virtual space within the city. And ever since then, we've always said, every project must have a leader and you should, will have design reviews, but you're mm -hmm. absolutely free as the leader to ignore them. You don't get this design by committee or being dragged down for lowest possible common denominator. And in fact, the rule is, if everyone thinks what you're doing is rather good, it probably isn't. <laughs> But Simon, um, Simon, it was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Uh, we really enjoyed it. Now we are going to start with Katrina. So we will see each other in about half an hour for the roundtable discussion. Thank you a lot. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, my pleasure. Before we welcome our second speaker, I want you to do something. I want you to pick up your phone, okay? Open Instagram mm -hmm, and search architects not architecture or simply scan this code, architects not architecture. Great, found it. Now press follow. Great, are you based in China or you don't use Instagram, you can scan this code to sign up for our newsletter. Now you won't miss any upcoming events. Thank you for supporting us. Our second speaker was born into a British family in Italy. She studied architecture at the Bartlett School of Architecture in London. In 2013, she co-founded together with Hugh McEwen Office S&M, an award-winning architecture practice working with a 50-50 split of public and private clients. As a recognized leader in her field, 
She has been appointed Design Council expert, advising the government and local authorities. She is an external examiner at Arts University Bournemouth and has lectured internationally, including at the Royal Academy of Arts, the Victoria and Albert Museum, University College London and Cambridge University. Their achievements to date include winning the Building Design's Young Architect of the Year Award in 2020, the inclusion in the Architects Journals 40 Under 40 also in 2020, and the recognition as Rising Start by River Journal in 2019. In addition to that, the practice will feature in the Architecture Foundation's New Architects 4 to be published in 2021. And probably the most important distinction, she is the youngest speaker at Architects Not Architecture so far. We are delighted to welcome her to our virtual stage. Welcome, Katrina Stewart. Hello, everyone. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for inviting me uh, to speak today, Furman. Um, so today I wanted to talk about my journey into architecture. Like many architects, um, my journey has not been linear. And I really believe that taking this indirect route and working within other disciplines has allowed me to produce better work today. So I'm going to start uh, with uh, my parents. Uh, they were both uh, born in Scotland and they grew up in Edinburgh. They met when they were really young, when they were 18, uh, and soon after, when they went on a trip to Tuscany, they discovered um, this tiny little village uh, called uh, Sassetta. And they loved it so much uh, that they decided uh, to never leave. In fact, they still live there now, uh, 40, 40 years later. So Sassetta is a, a tiny little village. Um, it's perched on the edge of a cliff with a population of 500. I was their firstborn. I was um, one of three uh, with two uh, younger brothers. And this is the village where I grew up. It was a very intimate community uh, and my school, um, in my school there were three kids in my class and 12 um, children in the whole school. I lived a life uh, that was really quite different from the life I live uh, in London today. So in the village, we were surrounded by craftspeople, makers, blacksmiths, carpenters and builders. In fact, every trade that you can imagine um, existed in, the, in this small village. And I think this had a huge influence on my parents. My parents had originally actually intended to uh, farm uh, the small plot of land that they had, but soon discovered that the 400 year old uh, giant oak tree in the middle of the field was sapping all the nutrients from the land, leaving none uh, for growing vegetables. So failing this, <laughs> when I was born, uh, they decided to start, start making uh, toys and initially these were just uh, were just for me um, but this soon developed into a passion and eventually a business and here I am on my dad's lap uh, while they're making hundreds of ducks. They sold uh, these toys at craft markets and shops I remember they would spend endless hours and days designing new toys, coming up with new ideas that they would test and build in the workshop. And here is my dad uh, with uh, my little brother at one of uh, the first markets uh, that they ever did um, exhibiting their toys. I spent my whole childhood in the workshop, working with wood, uh, designing and prototyping toys. All of, this, all of the toys uh, were designed to have movement and to have an element of surprise and discovery to them. I loved the immediacy of them and how they brought joy to children and adults alike. And of course, I always knew what I was going to get for Christmas that year. I remember the first time I visited Nikki de Saint-Fal's tarot garden. 
It's perched on a hill in the middle of uh, Tuscany. Niki de saint Fal uh, was a French-American artist um, who was one day passing through this area and found this site and this uh, small plot of land at the top of this hill, which she decided to develop into a tarot garden in the 1970s and decided that she would spend the rest of her life working on this tarot garden, building uh, these structures. Every building and structure here is built by Nikki and by her friends over a period of uh, 30 years. And in fact, they're still, they're still working on it um, today. I return most years and each time I discover new things about the place. Every space has a narrative woven into it, all designed by Nikki and built by her and her friends. But these were not simple structures. They used the latest building technologies and the latest materials using a rebar mesh um, as frames for these structures that they would later spray on uh, a concrete layer on. And finally, they would create um, uh, these, well, they would clad the structures with handmade uh, tiles molded to the structures and fired and, and designed by individuals and uh, Nikki on site and, and then fired in the kiln before applying them to, to these buildings. The whole garden was a collaboration and each person who worked on the build can still see themselves represented in the garden today. Nikki de saint Fal lived in her house, uh, which was uh, this sphinx um, that you can see uh, on the left with her bedroom in one breast and her kitchen in the other. Inside, every inch, every single inch of the space is covered in mirrors, including the oven, the fridge, every inch is covered in mirrors. And I really, I really learned um, from, from this project and from the Tower Garden that spaces both inside and out can be engaging and joyful just like the toys and objects we were designing at home. There are plenty of historical buildings of architectural merit in the area where I grew up, but there weren't many contemporary ones until Mario Botta one day paid a visit uh, to a local vineyard and he ended up designing and building a new winery there. And this was a building that appeared to be carved into the landscape but it also created this amazing amphitheater, which people could climb up and from which people could look back and uh, observe the landscape from. And this was my introduction to Mario Bottas, I suppose. So I learned about his work and uh, as a teenager, and I loved his use of geometry, light and shadows and the theatrical nature of his buildings. I also grew up in the 1980s and 90s, so I was heavily influenced by the Italian radical movement. Amongst these was Memphis, a group who advocated a departure from the past, proposing radical new ways of living. Their visions represented an overt break from the austerity that characterised the immediate post-war years in Italy. The group designed everything from objects to buildings and everything in between. Within this group was uh, Nathalie de Pasquier, whose work is, is shown here, who is a fashion designer, an architect, a visionary, using pattern and colour in extraordinary ways. Another post-war uh, Italian radical was uh, Gaetano Pesce, who taught me that there were so many new and innovative materials that one could use to build buildings. I was particularly interested in this piece of furniture that he designed called La Mamma. It is practical, but it also is saying something. It has a meaning. It's an armchair with a footstand, uh, but it can also represent a mother with an umbilical cord connected to her baby. Or it may also be read as a woman tied to a ball and a chain. Each person who uses or experiences this chair will interpret it in different ways. It also has a performative element to it. So it's made of foam, 
When you buy it, it's compressed into this pancake. And once you bring it home and open it up, it inflates like popcorn. I always remember this lecture that we went to see um, in London a few years ago when Gaetano Pesce was uh, um, presenting his work. And he described uh, this event when um, a lorry was uh, traveling on a motorway and carrying lots of these lamamme um, in, in the back. And the, the lorry uh, crashed and, and tipped over and everyone was okay. But all of the, all of the armchairs um, uh, fell out at the back of the lorry and popped out. And apparently it was like popcorn on, on the kind of motorway. So I suppose this, this design um, of, of you know, a simple piece of furniture, an armchair, it really encourages you to question its meaning and, and reflect on its, on, on its use. Gaetano also made buildings uh, like this one in Osaka, where he clad the structure with flower pots, creating vertical gardens. And he was what, what, actually one of the first uh, to do this. He used experimental and unconventional materials, just like this building called Pesce Trullo, which he designed to be coated in a thick insulating foam. It was also, it was all of these influences, I suppose, that led me to want to pursue my studies in, in architecture. When I turned 18, um, I moved, I decided to move to London to study architecture at the Bartlett. And this is uh, the beautiful old uh, Bartlett building. It's much better now. Um, but it was certainly not the most architectural, uh, architecturally inspiring building. But what it was lacking externally, it made up for in abundance internally with the people that I met. I was taught by, by some incredible tutors and studied alongside some many peers many of whom I have gone on to collaborate with and work with um, uh, in, in practice. Amongst my studio friends was Hugh McEwen, uh, who I worked alongside uh, during my final year at university at the Bartlett. And we found that we worked really, really well together um, you know, when, when we were studying. And we soon started working together on projects, you know, after, after finishing our studies. And this eventually led us to setting up Office s and in 2013. At the Bartlett, I was exposed to, you know, some incredible uh, architects work, uh, uh, including um, the Archigram uh, group. Um, uh, and particularly uh, Peter Cook's work, um, whose work I've always found uh, incredibly inspiring. We went on field trips uh, to Los Angeles, uh, where I went to see um, Charles and Ray Eames's house. They also design toys um, that become buildings. I've always loved drawing. I think I have, in fact, I think I have a whole bookcase of sketchbooks. I find this to be a really useful way to explore ideas, to record and to slow down without distractions. I like that you can only move as quickly as your hand allows. And in a world where so much of our days is spent watching moving images on a screen, sketching gives me the headspace to think things through and experiment. During my studies, um, I also discovered the work of Arakawa and Gins and their seminal book, We Have Decided Not to Die. Their philosophy was to elude death through the design of one's living space. They designed buildings that activated and stimulated the mind. For them, architecture should play an active role in people's lives. It should be engaging, challenging, and it should not be passive. It should not be background. The work of Dunham Raby was also incredibly influential to me, particularly their book, um, Speculative uh, Everything, where through design, they explore the social, cultural, and ethical implications of existing and emerging technologies. Their work challenges our preconceptions and cultural norms. 
I visited their exhibition in the Science Museum, which explored energy futures. It looked at a future where human waste might become a valuable energy source and be preserved and valued for what it is. So when, when I turned 21, um, after completing the first uh, stages of my studies at the Bartlett, I travelled to uh, the Earthship community, an off-grid community in the middle of a desert in Taos in New Mexico in, in the States. And here I learned that we could build and fuel buildings from waste, that buildings and homes can be self-sufficient, they can collect their own water, energy, and even grow their own food. Here, just like Dun and Raby speculated, human waste is also used as a fertilizer to grow food um, to serve dinner uh, in the evenings. And here my job was uh, actually to be a, a builder. So you can see me in, in, the, in the crowd uh, next to one of the earth ships that um, we had uh, been working on. I learned everything from plastering to building walls out of cans and bottles and ramming uh, tires with earth to form structures. I discovered how you can alter weather conditions in a building by carefully considering every aspect of the build. Here, they have been able to grow a banana tree uh, and plants and uh, all sorts of vegetables in an earth ship in the middle of a desert where on the outside you can't see a tree for miles and miles. And I've always been interested in design and play, and this has included uh, the digital realm as well as the physical, and particularly computer games. I'm fascinated, fascinated by these worlds and how architecture is designed within these environments, where scale and gravity don't exist, I'm particularly interested in indie games, uh, which push the boundaries of what digital games can be. So here, Monument Valley, for example, was one of, one of my favourite games to play uh, and um, incredibly kind of influential for me. And when I first finished my studies in 2011, I started exploring the possibility of developing some of um, the work I had done during my university years into an animation or game. I knew uh, that as a young architect uh, or as a young graduate, not even an architect yet, um, it was really unlikely that I would be commissioned to design a building or a, phys or a physical building. But perhaps I could build in the digital realm and people would still be able to experience these spaces. So around the time I, I finished at university, I uh, met up with um, uh, someone called uh, Luke Whitaker in a cafe one day. And we, we got talking about, um, you know, potentially working on, uh, on, a, on a game together. Uh, and these ideas developed um, and we continued to kind of uh, initially have discussions and, and talk through these ideas. Um, but eventually that led uh, to us um, starting to work on, on developing uh, a computer game, a handmade computer game together. We worked through drawings and models to develop the narrative and spaces of the game. Luke's background uh, was in graphic design uh, and most of the small team of people, there were only four or five people, um, who worked on the game had never actually worked on a game before. So artists, musicians, and even a BBC nature cameraman uh, worked on, on developing this game. Each person brought something new and, and special to the project. And in some ways that naivety or, or you know, not fully understanding how, you know, mo having not built a game before actually in some ways helped us. We were using very simple techniques uh, and the tools that we had available. We built a 3D, um, a, a three meter high model of the city and animated a 2D character in flash um, over, over the top of it. 
And this uh, culminated in the game being released in 2015 and being recognised uh, with the BAFTA Award uh, for Artistic Achievement um, that, that same year. So while I was working on this game, uh, I also continued to work um, on projects with you. We founded the practice in 2013, uh, following a, a couple of competition wins um, that uh, we had entered um, to work on projects on high streets and um, within the public realm. Initially, uh, as you can see, uh, we did not have an office uh, and both had you know, full-time jobs. Uh, we worked in evenings and weekends, in cafes or any, any space that we could find. Our early projects included uh, stage sets, exhibitions, and we continued to work um, for other practices alongside teaching uh, for the first uh, five years um, of our practice. In fact, we taught, um, we taught at Oxford, Oxford Brookes University, but also we returned to the Bartlett and taught um, for a few years there. Eight years on, uh, we are now a team of four working from East London. Uh, and this year we were recognised uh, with the award of uh, Young Architect of the Year by Building Design. And we continue to work on projects uh, that elevate the everyday, acknowledging the existing while deploying colour and narrative inventively to create drama. We continue to collaborate with other clients, makers uh, uh, and specialists, experimenting with colours and materials to deliver joyful and unexpected private spaces and public places. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katrina, for the wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, Katrina, what do you think, uh, how do you think the experience with the video game Luminous City influenced you? Um, yeah, I think, it, I think it was, it was an amazing experience to be able to um, finish at university and, and still be able to uh, design, you know, design spaces and design buildings that in some way people mm. would be able to kind of experience. Um, I think the way that it, I suppose the way that it informs the work that we do today, we're always very interested in narrative, um, and narrative mm. plays a big part in, um, in the projects that we work on uh, today. Um, and these are stories from, you know, people and the clients that we work with, um, but also our, our kind of collaborators. Um, mm. So I'd say the, the kind of narrative aspect is the, is the thing that I suppose mm -hmm. We, we continue uh, to work on. And um, how do you see um, the topic virtual world influencing the way we design the real world? Uh, to one, a friend of mine asked me a couple of weeks ago if I know an architect who can design in a, a, a virtual office. Uh, and I was surprised. <laughs> it was it's, uh, a new world for me. Um, what do you think about that? I think it, I think it is something that we that you know I am very interested in, but I think having grown up in, at a time where we you know we didn't have so much exposure to the internet or to the kind of digital world. Yes, mm -hmm. we had phones. Maybe you know when I probably when I turned fourteen or something. But we 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 didn't interact with the digital world and the, in anywhere near near the way that we do today i also am very aware of the things that um you know things like computer games lack you know that that kind of tactility that that um um that touch element uh, that you know that mm -hmm. we are still not able to achieve and i suppose that was also the reason why we wanted to make a game that was handmade that was mm. actually, you know, we were allowed to kind of make mistakes or there was that kind of, you know, a, an element of that tactility within, within the game. Actually, it looks similar to the picture, you, the first slide of the, yes. the <laughs> Toscana um, or the, maybe the, the stand with the shop of your father 
with the toys. It's yeah. kind of kind of similar. It's very beautiful. Um, now, eight years after you founded the practice with you, um, what advice? Let me uh, ask it, ask the question currently. Um, what advice would you have loved to get back in 2013 when you founded the practice? I think that's a really, really interesting question um, and yeah, hard one to answer, I suppose. I think, I think what I would, I suppose, say to myself is to trust the process, to trust that you will get there <laughs> in the end. Um, because I think especially if you're, if you're working, you know, as a young architect, you're constantly mm -hmm. doing things that you don't know about because you don't, you know, you're learning, you're learning new things. And of course, that requires a certain amount of bravery um, mm -hmm. and kind of resilience as well. Uh, but also trust that, you know, if you, if you pursue those ideas and continue to kind of work hard and develop those ideas, that they will result in something mm -hmm. that is, is positive. And it has been very positive. Uh, the last couple of years, you have received many awards and a lot of recognition for your work. Very happy for that. Um, with the current um, pos position of the practice, what is the biggest challenge you are facing today? That's a good question. I think in the in the environment that we're in, I think. I suppose every, it, every practice um, will have new new challenges. Um, I think it is always, I suppose, to continue to do the work um, that you like to do, that you continue to build uh, and mm -hmm. kind of um, make spaces that are beneficial, I suppose, to, to the world. Um, but I think it's also, I think, a kind of, realization that after this year you know people people care a lot more people care about their well-being a lot more and people care about about nature a lot more and i suppose mm -hmm. you know i think that's a really positive thing uh, um and uh will you know will make the world a kind of better place uh for it mm. uh, and what motivates you the most about the future I think I think this I think the fact that you know the world has to change that things need to change I think we've all got to a place now where you know things if things don't change then mm -hmm. you know where it's going to end badly and and I think the the fact that also there's a real kind of focus on people's well-being as well and you know as mm -hmm. architects we are completely you know, we design spaces and um, people's well-being is entire. You know, completely affected by the spaces that we design. Um, so I think I think it's this change and um, I suppose repositioning of of priorities that I th I think is is really positive. For that, it's uh, really nice that we are having today two different backgrounds coming together. Um, what if uh, we start the roundtable discussion with Simon and we welcome him for the roundtable discussion? So, Simon, can you join us? Thank, Thank you, you for joining you. us. Um, that that topic about the future, uh, I think we were Katrina talking before we went live uh, about that um, regarding a possible possible question for for Simon. Katrina, do you want to formulate? Do you want to ask that question we talked uh, before we started? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I suppose I, I suppose my question would be, and obviously your you know your practice is one of the best known practices in in, in the UK, and you've had um, you know thirty years of of developing developing uh, your practice through through the projects that you're doing. I suppose my question is what 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 do you what do you want for the next twenty years? Now that you're an established practice, what what do you see the future of the practice being? I, I want to be around for the next twenty years. That would that would be a, that would be be a starter. Um, 
I, th I think listen, you talk very clearly about the world resetting. And in the very early days of our practice, we were you know, working with the likes of Patrick Bellier and Atelier 10 and exploring kind of low energy sort of autonomous house like the one Alex Pike, who I knew as a kid, developed at Cambridge. So we were at the kind of beginning of you know uh, indu industrial scale exploration of of low energy, not so much carbon, but low energy mm -hmm. uh, use of resources. And I, I, I kind of think we've entered a new, a new era. The world has entered a new era that you spoke about, where we value things differently, and the acceptance of our responsibility is now clear, accepted by ourselves, um, demanded upon us by society, accepted and embraced by clients. So I think that is a reset that's incredibly exciting. And in a way, to me, it's a whole new chapter. And, and mm -hmm. therefore, I, I'm just looking forward to engaging with that chapter. Yes, we're a mature office, but it's full of many people who have a lot less experience than you. So mm -hmm. it's that idea about age and experience allied to um, kind of questioning youth and then developing um, and testing how our architecture gets transformed by this challenge, how we discover what, you know, a low carbon architectural future looks like. And by that, I mean mm. the environment, how we mm. live, how we think about buildings. I think as long as, you know, you start with an Italian hill town, to me, buildings are long-term assets. Mm. For 10 years, I've talked about theater, stage, set and props. I've always said, use is the thing that evolves and changes. Architecture is kind of permanent. Can it be generous enough, and as you've shown, celebratory enough to make life want to keep it? And that's the interesting to me for the future. How do we make buildings and environments that will allow future generations to love them? Because if they don't, mm. love them, they won't keep them. We will have failed. Mm. So I think it's it, that's that's the future to me. It's one we all face. That's a nice answer. Thank you, Katrina, for the for the question. Simon, do you have a question maybe for Katrina? Yeah, I mean, look, I thought yours, one is an observation. I thought there was an extraordinary journey, personal journey, which highlights to me that architecture education is currently too focused in schools and mm. could be more out in life. You know, I think you're working in your workshop and education is wonderful, but let's, let's allow it to spread out mm. over our careers and, and not compress it all at the beginning. For, financial reasons but also cultural reasons that mm. engagement you've had with making as well as drawing virtually and physically you know in, in new mexico etc that seems to me to define the wonderful trajectory of your practice i mean what i'd like to think is over the next 10 years as you you know flourish you can scale up and help invent new processes of working to allow you to remain engaged with workers, mm. you know, with, with makers, you know, but actually scale up to take that architecture in, into bigger projects. That I think is a wonderful challenge for you. I'm pretty mm. certain you have the resilience to do it, but I, I, I would sort of hope you don't become the most wonderfully celebrated art practice of, of, of miniature <laughs> form, but actually, you know, your public practice grows and your, your involvement in, in bigger scale projects grows because I think you know, that is where the future lies to sort of shake up architecture mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I don't know whether that appeals to you or not <laughs> yes no I, I, I think I, I think it, it definitely does I mean we've I suppose we've always um, kept a kind of 50 50 split between working on you know with private clients and working with public clients. And I think that range of, of kind of um, projects, I think, is, is something that we will always um, want to continue with. Um, you know, especially as you, you, you learn so much, you know, with each project that you, you kind of start. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that's something that, you know, we, it will be a kind of challenge ahead, but I think, I think we've already started, um, you know, going, going on that journey. And I, and I suppose it's, it's about kind of you know working, um, working with people and and uh, collaborating and um, you know I suppose nurturing those relationships um, in order to uh, create you know um, buildings and uh, and and spaces I suppose. 
Actually, and no Katrina, doubt you have the resilience to do it, as well as the, obviously the talent. We have uh, a couple of questions for you both. Uh, one of them is for Katrina regarding also how do you um, design, how do you do it with your clients? Uh, the question from the audience, from the audience is, uh, Do you find much resistance from planners to your colorful designs proposals regarding resilience? <laughs> I think we are often I think we often get this question. Um, and in some ways it always it always kind of surprises me. And obviously, you know, the, the work that we do is um, you know, maybe maybe appears to be slightly kind of different. But it, it, it does come from a really careful analysis of, you know, of a place, of um, the history of a place, uh, but also of, you know, working with, with clients and, and kind of developing mm -hmm. those ideas. So I think, you know, with planners, you know, every, every planning officer is, is different. But I think we always engage with, you know, in a conversation really early on. So we always make it really clear what that kind of process and that thought process is and that you know our buildings are are incredibly contextual but not it may not appear to uh, be contextual if if you kind of see it um uh, in an image i suppose that's really nice um simon there's a question from the audience which is very serious um any lifelong goals to this of designing sheffield stadium oh uh I did once have a conversation with a man in the pub about, about doing the oldest football club in the world, Sheffield, and it didn't go anywhere. No, I, um, I think architecture is best kept out of football stadiums. In fact, in the, in the low carbon world, it's, it's the recycling of the grand old stadiums that we should be doing, not pulling them down for the new characterless tin ones. So I think there's a kind of low carbon story about heritage that we need to build upon. Mm. Okay. Um, there is also a question for you, Simon, regarding um, uh, what would you, what will be your advice? No, what will your advice be to people starting up now and trying to shake things up in similar way when you didn't want to be associated with your father's work? I think um, you have to do what you believe in. I mean, you know, as you know. Katrina's just said, you, you, you have a way of seeing the world. You can't become a mirror to everyone else. You bring your personality to, to the situation as a designer and as a person. And, mm -hmm. and, and but you do then have to engage with the physical place, the moment in time, and the people who have commissioned you. And therefore, clients, public and private sector, You know, are, are the same. They're incredibly important generators of how you can respond, how free you can be, how much they can constrain you. Will they champion your thinking? So you have to learn and listen and be kind of uh, mm -hmm. realize that, that listen to whatever intelligence they give you and then give it back to them in, mm -hmm. in your own personal form. And on a purely practical basis, When we were struggling with our gambling and our sandwiches and you know, surviving on very little and a bit of teaching, um, a former, you know, a just retired architect walked into the office who we, I knew of old and said to me, if a client walks through the door who you don't like and they offer you, know, they offer you a job, take them into your office, write them a cheque for £20,000 and ask them to leave you alone. Because I, because I, I can assure you, you'll lose a lot more money working with someone you don't like. Mm -hmm. so you have to have a personal relationship with your client. It will be difficult, but you have to have a mutual respect. doesn't matter about money, doesn't matter about the planning situation, but if you and your client are prepared to go on a journey, you can do wonderful things. But if you're not mm -hmm. aligned, you never will be. So don't make your architecture secret. Share all your intents with your clients and make them part of the journey. What do you think about that, Katrina? How was your, how was your experience? Was it similar to that? <laughs> I, I completely, completely agree. I think, I think in the same way as, as you know, clients uh, can challenge you, it's also, you know, people that you're working with or, um, you know, makers that you're collaborating with. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think it's really important to 
kind of invest in those relationships and invest in in that kind of journey of 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 designing because without if you were to design on your own then you know it would probably not end up very you know very good i think i think being challenged i think is 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 um makes for a better project at the end um because you're constantly kind of pushing and you're constantly you know at the edge of what what you kind of understand but also you're learning from you're learning from other people um to yeah to i suppose uh, develop your projects mm -hmm. um now uh, simon that you are um going to be um I started in September, president of Reba. Um, in an interview, you say that that you hope to help change Reba's ability, uh, ability to support our talented and diverse membership. How do you think institutions, at not only in the UK, should support the young practices? Um, yeah, so, so I think it was Groucho Marx said, "Yeah, you know, I wouldn't be a you know a member of any club that would have me." And I think architects are always suspicious of clubs, but RIBA, the RIBA, is simply a, you know, a voluntary uh, organization created by architects to further architecture. And so the RIBA can't solve the world's problems, but what the RIBA can do is, I think, bring people together to share ideas. So you know, I mentioned earlier about you know, a different kind of autodidactic career. I think To, to make our profession diverse and rich and appropriate for the future, we need to rethink architectural education and create many, many more pathways in. Most of the great architects that you know have been referenced probably never went to an architectural school. That doesn't mean architectural <laughs> schools are bad. I like them a lot. But we don't need to sort of assume that the way we do it now is the way forever. So that's one thing we can do to open up the profession, to make it accessible, affordable and desirable. In terms of helping young practices, I think, you know, actually, if you're sharing ideas in discourse, on the net, in exhibitions, then actually it becomes a sort of hub around which ideas collate. So Katrina talked about meeting someone in a cafe or a bar or a street or whatever. And we have these informal networks, but not everyone has access to those networks. So mm -hmm. something like the RIBA can create a global network for discussing anything from how to work with makers and transform 21st century contracts to low carbon design to you know uh, more more accessible pathways into the profession so it becomes a place around which ideas and people coalesce otherwise it will die and if an institute dies that's fine mm -hmm. it's no longer relevant however i think it is relevant because we can't all speak We can, we can speak to each other, but something like the RIBA can engage better with the public and government or help us engage better with the public and government to celebrate the best work of young practices. So I think it's about creating a support network. And certainly from my experience as a young practitioner, the profession is generally generous and willing to share and bounce ideas and encouraging that generosity and collaboration and bringing different practices of different scales together. You know, the RIBA can assist in all of those things, but we need to create a kind of confident profession that wants to do that, that isn't running a fear of fees or litigation or insurance. Mm. And all the real big issues that, that practices face, professional indemnity insurance, these kinds of things, we've got to make the profession a little more competent, a little more confident, and actually a little more commercial. I don't mean that in a bad way, but if you can't earn a living from architecture, we are excluding the vast number of the population. You know, it may not be a great living, mm -hmm. but if it isn't accessible and if it isn't desirable, we will not attract people and it will remain, as it was in the 19th century, a club for wealthy people. And it mm -hmm. definitely shouldn't be that. Yeah, actually, probably, Katrina, right now, having you are four team members right now it mm -hmm. must be super challenging you have to be deciding of if you want are, are you expanding expanding the team or or growing or not growing it's kind of a challenging um uh situation yeah right? i mean yeah we're, we're a small small practice um 
Uh, and yeah, I mean, I think there are certainly kind of challenges, challenges ahead. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think we are also, we like to work on the projects that we kind of work on. And so I think we are happy to kind of expand and grow organically, but I suppose it's not, it's not, um, mm -hmm necessarily something that uh, we kind of aspire to, I suppose, at, at, at this very moment. Mm. Simon, was that planned to be, you, are you right now 500? Uh, never, yeah, 500, but we've never had a plan. Let's be very clear. We've never had a business plan. Do you recommend a plan? A plan uh, or no, you I, go I, with I, the I, flow? Go with the flow. I mean, put some, put some basic systems in place like try and get some money in the bank and, and make I mean, look, basically good designers go bust um, yeah, as, as well as bad designers. And so, so, so have a, a simple uh, financial model that allows you to, to draw a living and survive and have a little bit of cash in the bank for when people default on paying you or delay. I mean, it's very basic stuff. We never had a plan. We were four people for five years. And yeah, mm -hmm. we slowly grew. We took on two... Uh, students of ours, Susie Legood, Kerry Davis, who are now directors, have been with us 30 years, one left wow. and come back. But yeah, that's also good. Our view is if you want to leave and go somewhere else, that's wonderful. Yeah. If you want to come back, you know, when you've done whatever you want to do, that's wonderful too. So we, we never had a plan. We used to worry about size. We don't want it to be more than 10 or 15 or 20. And mm. then we, we just decided it should be, as long as we're doing the projects that we think are worth doing, then size doesn't matter. And at the moment, we will shrink, hopefully just by natural wastage, where people decide they want to go and live somewhere else or become illustrators or have a sabbatical. So, you know, we're quite happy to shrink. Growth and numbers have never been an issue to mm. us. Yeah, that's but interesting. Trina's plan is enjoy doing what they're doing as well as they can. <laughs> and if more people who are like-minded want to commission them, don't be afraid mm. to take on more colleagues, but I'm sure you're not. You know, I'm sure you're more yeah. than open to that. I'm sure you've got a network of people that you can, you know, draw upon. And also, as you said, collaborate with. You can create a network of, you know, friendly practices. We have a question also from the audience asking, um, that will be maybe for Katrina, I think for both of us, for both of you. Um, if someone has a passion for design and architecture, but realize this passion later in life, do you think it's too late to start a career in architecture? Katrina, you are the youngest speaker at architecture, <laughs> architecture so far. Um, what do you think about that? I mean, I think, I think it also, you know, I think the work that you've done in other disciplines will inform, you know, inform the work that you do in architecture. Um, I think it, for me, it's never too late to to start, um, you know, something that you're passionate about and working uh, in something that you're passionate about. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think you kind of start, you start from scratch. I think. You know, as, as Simon was saying, you, you bring so much of your kind of life and um, travels and experiences into the work that you do. And, you know, inevitably that will that will allow you to kind of create, you know, things that are that are new or, or different in some way. Um, but, yeah, no, I don't think it's ever too late. What do you think about that, Simon? What would be your answer? It's never too late. Never have regrets in life you know, take the plunge, do what you want to do. And I actually think um, new new people with different backgrounds in terms of their education, mm. their, you know, what, what they've experienced in life, coming to architecture, whether you're 30, 40, 50, you, you will bring something to the profession. And the profession needn't be modelled as this long, slow, five-year course and two years study. You know, we have apprentices working in our office, you know, doing a day a week and working, working for us four days a week. Yeah, and they bring valuable insights. You know, a computer gamer could probably w walk into my office or Katrina's office tomorrow and bring something, mm -hmm. as could a model maker. You know, mm -hmm. so, so, so people who care 
about the potential of architecture, go for it, 100%. Don't have regrets in life. Sounds great. That's a nice answer. Um, what, is, um, what would you never compromise on to get a new project? Um, Katrina, would you like to go first? I think I think this is a really a really important question. I think like like Simon, we we don't have a business plan, <laughs> but we have. Um, I suppose we think that it's really important to have a set of values, uh, and and these values have you know changed and developed over the years um, that we've developed uh, the practice. But it is really important to have those values, and, and you know sometimes you do need to say you do need to say no, um, uh, and I and I think it yeah it's really important um, that that you measure every project against the values that you have, um, rather than um, for financial reasons or, or other reasons. And Simon. Uh I mean, I don't, I don't be a record, but agree with Katrina again. But in the end, um, you ha you have you know you, your position will evolve. We, we we have a statement, the founder statement we wrote when we became an employee ownership trust. It lays out what we do and why. And we always say we make money to make architecture. We don't make architecture to make money. So it's architecture mm -hmm. first for us, and that means we review every project. And we won't work with certain situations in certain places um, with certain people if we don't like them. And there's, a, you know, as well as the kind of personal values or collective shared values as a practice, there's also an idea if you don't have a, a commitment to the project and you're unhappy in it, it will be a disaster as well. Mm. Yeah, mm. The idea of doing a project because it will make you money alone is not enough. Mm. Too tough. So our rule is simply we make money to make architecture. That's a good, uh, a good strategy. Uh, we have maybe the one last question also from the audience. Um, we have, as we can see also with the questions, many uh, young professionals. Um, one question is uh, what would be a Uh, what would be a best way for an architect to establish his or her own small, pra small practice? And what would be the best way to reach out to potential clients? Um, Simon, would you like to go first? Yeah, what we did was we, we did competitions in the evening before we set up the office. So we did competitions from the moment we left college and we won some and people get to hear who you are and you use competitions as a vehicle to test ideas. We also lost lots of competitions. So competitions are important to build up your architectural language and your, your, your personal you know, expression. Um, social life is important, you know, meeting people, being, you know, chance encounters are where a large number of our projects have come. And, you know, No project is too small. The smallest project mm -hmm. was a, a, a desk for Jeremy Melvin, which was in his study that was a cantilevered piece. So little domestic projects, as long as there's an idea in that project you know, that you and the client pursue, mm -hmm. the smallest thing is, is, you know, can make a huge difference. And you can present these as a suite of ideas. So to me, it's about, and teaching is another thing, that kind of... Yeah engagement with with your with star, other staff and students is vital and you become part of a kind of connected network of people and architects are quite generous and do feed projects down through the system you know a project that's not right for, for me might be right for someone else and i've always mm -hmm. thought that's one of the elegant things about the profession is a large number of the early projects we got were from other architects saying try this young practice Katrina, mm. tell me, you're, you're right at the <laughs> cutting edge of this. Katrina, you did something similar, right? With competitions and yeah, lots of teaching I at mean, the university? Yeah, we, we entered lots of competitions, lost a lot, <laughs> won a few. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, absolutely. And I, and I think every, every, everyone's different. But, you know, with, with me and Hugh, for example, we set up the practice over five years. So it was a slow process, you know, initially we were just working on evenings and slowly every year we dedicated one more day. 
we taught for six years um, together. Um, and, you know, in that, in that way, it also felt like the, the projects that we were taking on were not a huge risk to us financially because we were supported in other ways through teaching or, you know, the other work that we were doing. So I think, mm. I think that was for us a, a good way. But, it, you know, it, it, I think it is also, you know, seeking opportunities and, and you know, um, and, you know, saying, saying yes to, you know, mm. uh, to opportunities that come, come by you. Um, but I think competitions is a hard one because, of course, competitions do yeah. also take a huge amount of time. So I think you do as a small practice and, you know, still now we're very selective about the competitions we enter because um because we you know we're we're only small you know small practice um mm. and our, our time uh yeah is stretched i suppose that's right but maybe now it's even easier than ever with social media to share what you what you do your work so uh, that i think that's super uh helpful so that you are more connected as simon said um absolutely it It has been a huge ple pleasure to share one and a half hours together with you and with the audience. It's, like, it's kind of sad that we cannot share a glass of wine <laughs> now uh, at the lobby. Um, hopefully we can meet soon in a real auditorium. Um, we will definitely do uh, future events as hybrid events because uh, it's very really nice at the same time to reach people all over the world. We are extremely thankful for your time. Uh, it was super interesting. Uh, I would like also to thank our partners, Jung and Cosentino, and uh, also your team, especially Simon, um, your team helping with the, with the coordination of the, of the talk. It has been a huge pleasure, and I'm kind of I'm happy, but I'm, kind of outside. I, I'm a bit sad at the same time. Uh, thank you a lot for your time. Hope you have a nice evening. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>